what I'm going to try and do tonight is really talk about the, the landscape of cluster headache, um, try and talk a bit about differential diagnosis and its management. As Deirdre said, if you don't follow everything, because I'm going to go quite fast through a lot of things, please feel free to ask for the slides. You get an exact copy of these on the PDF version that, that Deirdre can send you. Um, so hopefully that will, that will cover things. Um, the other thing I was going to say is that if, if this goes down well and you like this talk, then you can always uh, potentially see me again. And then I, I, I may even get asked back to do one on migraine and non-headache symptoms and looking at comorbidities. So have a chance to sort of come around and talk about a slightly different angle on headache disorders. So that's the Liverpool skyline there. And hold on. Um, there we are. So these are my disclosures. Um, Basically, I, I work in a number, of, a number of areas for clinical treatment trials and in scientific advice. I'm just going to give you four cases. Um, I, I generally give the same lectures to neurologists as I do to patients because I think well, actually most patients with cluster headache know more, more, than, more about cluster headache than most neurologists in my, in my sort of experience. So don't worry if some of these, some of these sort of um, terminologies you don't follow, but it's just to get a basic idea, and I'll come back to this slide at the end. So I've got four patients, and which of these might have cluster headache? So have a think about it during the lecture. So one is a 36-year-old man who's got a constant unilateral headache, but three to five times a week, he has episodes of severe worsening, each lasting three to six hours with autonomic disturbance, symptoms around the eye, the nose, the ears, and the face. Second patient would be a 24-year-old lady who has episodes lasting about 20 to 120 minutes. They're severe, worst headache in her life. They're bilateral, so they're both sides of the head, but she's agitated, restless. She's got the eye symptoms, nose symptoms, ear symptoms, wakes her up at three o'clock every morning. The third patient is an 18-year-old lady with attacks of severe headache just on one side, daily basis, Typically one attack every night, red, runny eye, worst pain you could imagine, more than 20 out of 10. The same attacks in the day happen, and then she gets visual disturbance, like an evolving zigzag kaleidoscope picture, like a curly, curved C kaleidoscope that happens reproducibly before her attacks. The fourth one is a 46-year-old man who's never had pain, never had pain, but presented about eight years ago with a small pupil or called a Horner's syndrome and a droopy eyelid. And now he has episodes where he feels flushed and he feels sweaty, his ear feels full on that side, his eye waters on that side, and it occurs four to five times a day, but he has no pain. So what headaches do we see in clinical practice? We, we divide headaches into primary headaches and secondary headaches. Secondary headaches are generally conditions that are brought about by another disorder. So the headache is a manifestation of a problem. So an example of that might be a brain tumor where someone's got a lump in their head, it causes headaches, or someone has inflammation of the blood vessels and it causes headaches. Those are quite rare. And we only really start thinking about those if people have a daily headache that doesn't usually disappear because nasty things don't usually take days off. So someone who's got an intermittent headache disorder and has days when they're fine, it's highly unlikely you've got anything nasty. Anyone also who's had symptoms going on for more than three months, it becomes far less likely that you've got anything nasty going on as well. So when we look at primary headache disorders, these are the way you're made. These are disorders that you can blame your parents for, it's in your genes to some extent. And what we see is we see migraine, and I've done them in size in terms of the commonest. Migraine is by far the commonest. I think a condition called hemicrania continua, and I'm gonna come back to all these terms later. I think a condition called hemicrania continua is actually not that uncommon. Cluster headache is not common, but it's not excruciatingly rare. New daily persistent headache is what it says on the tin. It happened one day and it stayed, is an entity that's probably less common than cluster. People may have heard of this condition sunk or sooner, short-lived unilateral neuralgiform headache with conjunctival injection, conjunctival injection and tearing and breathe. Okay, so basically the, the longer the name of the headache disorder, the shorter the attack, that's our rule. Paroxysmal hemicrania is very rare. 
And then I thought it said tension type headache down here, but that's probably just a smudge on the slide because many people think that tension type headache doesn't exist. And if you look at the famous, famous picture here or version of the famous picture, um, a tight band-like headache, people think of tension type headache. Actually, uh, the clue in this picture is there's no head, so there's no headache. So tension type headache doesn't really exist. Um, if you think it does, then you probably misdiagnosed migraine. This is more for reference than really working out what, what you know. I don't want you to go through it in detail, but features of tension type headache, it probably doesn't exist. It's never severe. It, it never limits activity. Migraine, one side or both sides, typically attacks lasting hours to days. People want to stay still. They may get a little bit of this autonomic disturbance in the face, red eye, runny eye, droopy eye, puffy eye, twitchy eye, stuffy nose, runny nose, facial flushing, facial sweating, a sense of fullness in the ear or tinnitus. But with migraine, if they get that disturbance, it's usually mild or subtle. Whereas in conditions like cluster headache and paroxysmal hemicrania, it's actually really pro it's a prominent feature. So tension type headache doesn't really exist. Migraine is very, very common. And most people have migraine if they have any sort of cause for the headache disorder. Hemicrania continua is quite a lot rarer. It's a one-sided continuous disorder, which may cause agitation and may cause this cranial autonomic disturbance. Cluster headache, the talk of this lecture, the, the subject of this lecture I'll go into in a lot. But what you'll see with these conditions, hemicrania, cluster, paroxysmal hemicrania and sunct, they're all relatives to each other. They all tend to cause restlessness and agitation. They're all generally on one side of the head and they all generally have um, autonomic disturbance. So if I see someone in clinic, what do I really want to know? And what, what are the things that you can tell us that give us the best diagnosis? I want to know your behavior. I want to know what you actually do in an attack. Do you lie down and rest, more like migraine, or are you up about pacing, holding your head, more like cluster headache and its relatives? Is your headache disorder on just one side of the head? and stays on one side, or can it actually be both sides or swap sides? If it's both sides or swap sides, it makes it far more likely it's gonna be migraine. The attack duration and the attack timing. So I'm gonna come onto this in terms of cluster in a minute, but for, for timing, but for duration, we think of uh, cluster headache as attacks lasting maybe 20 minutes to four hours. We think of migraine as attacks lasting maybe four hours to a day or two. And then we have shorter conditions like paroxysmal hemicrania, very, very similar to cluster headache, but the attacks are much briefer and many more. And we have sunk where you have even more attacks, maybe hundreds in a day, and, um, and they're very, very brief to fit them in, a second or two each. Early alcohol triggering. Um, having had Paddy's Day just a few days ago, many of you might have been aware of this, and you would expect your typical traditional Paddy Day's hangover the next day, you wouldn't expect it while you're out drinking. Um, that's migraine if it's the next day. If it's actually during your first or second drink, within the first hour to hour and a half, then that's more typical of cluster headache. Discrete cutaneous triggers, people are often aware of things like trigeminal neuralgia where touching the face or cold winds or talking or eating can trigger sudden pain in the face. But there is a headache disorder, which I mentioned before called sunct, which also has cutaneous triggering. So trigeminal neuralgia and sunk are the two that you can potentially touch, ow, touch, ow, touch, ow, you know, discrete cause and effect. Prominent autonomic disturbance. Autonomic disturbance can happen with any headache disorder. You can pluck an eyebrow and your eye will water, you know, or your nose will run. So any facial pain can cause autonomic disturbance, but when it's really prominent, it puts you in the, in the sort of remit for cluster headache. And the other thing is bouts. Do you have periods of time where for say four weeks or eight weeks or three months you get headaches and then you're fine for a year or two? That's fine. That's far more sort of, uh, likely to be seen in things like cluster headache. But all the meagerness features of sensitivity to noise, light, smell, nausea, vomiting and aura are completely non-specific and they don't help us discriminate what the type of headache is. So migraine the disorder versus migraine the biology. Migraine can be a tax, but it's also a way that you're made. So those people who have a migraine predisposition, 
will have had travel sickness quite commonly, back of cars, boats, buses, reading in cars. They may have had um, irritable bowel syndrome symptoms. They may have had rainos where their fingers go white in the cold. They may get undeserved hangovers. I only had one drink and I had a headache the next day and they may have a family history. So that tells me whether that person has a sort of migraine biology. And the point is that anyone who has a migraine biology, it doesn't matter which headache disorder they get, if they've got migranous genes, when they get their headache, it's gonna have migranous features. So you can have migraine, which is associated with nausea, sensitivity to noise, sensitivity to light, sensitivity to smell. But if you're made in the way that you have a sort of migraine genetic predisposition, when you get your other headache disorder, say you get a bang on the head and a post-traumatic headache, you may get sensitivity to noise, sensitivity to light, sensitivity to smell. If you get cluster headache, you may get sensitivity to noise, sensitivity to light, sensitivity to smell. Brain tumor, you may get all those as well. So in other words, all the things that most doctors ask you about, the visual aura, the sensitivity to noise, light and smell, the nausea and the vomiting, don't help us at all in distinguishing the different types of headache. And everyone who has migraine biology can wear a migraine hat. Something else can come along and it will give you a headache with migraineous features, despite the fact it's a different type of headache disorder. So in migraine, I just want to talk about migraine a bit because I think it, it is, it's the background of most headache disorders. And even with all the other people who have cluster headache, they will often have migraineous features. So these things are useful to know. There are three things that happen in migraine. You've got your amplification, you've got autonomic disturbance and you have brain dysfunction. So with amplification, basically everything is heightened. Um, you know, a migraineur cannot stand a biro clicking or someone tapping regularly. They don't like it. A migraineur is a great person to employ on a switchboard because they won't leave the phone ringing. They don't like repetitive stimuli. So it's the same with other things. We normally turn off to what we don't want to know about. We want to know if something's some going to suddenly, you know, if a tiger's suddenly going to pounce on us and eat us, that's when we want to know something's there. We don't want to just know that there's a tiger, tiger cut out, you know, a sort of picture of a tiger there that's not going to do anything to me. So I only want to know when something's changing in the environment. I don't want to just see what's there all the time. It's why migraineurs don't recognize that trains are passing all the time when they live near railway stations. So sensitivity to movement, noise, light, smell, everything can get amplified. Your, your inner ear input can cause dizziness because they get amplified, you get throbbing, your skin becomes tender and painful. This is the amplification. It's literally turning up the amplifiers in the brain. Autonomic disturbance are all the things like the involuntary actions, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, passing a lot of urine, going pale or flushed. And the ones in the face that I talked about, eyes, red, droopy, um, runny, blocked runny nose, flushing, sweating, fullness in the ear, tinnitus. And then in migraine, you may get brain dysfunction. We know this with aura where you see visual disturbance, but we also see mood change. We see dissociation where people don't feel part of the room. We see confusion. We see problems with concentration, fatigue and restless legs. So this is what I think happens in migraine. And when you get your pain, it can be anywhere. It doesn't have to be just in the head or face. It can be in the neck and quite commonly 40 to 50% of migraineurs will start with pain in the neck, but it can be chest or breast. We see patients who present with what looks like a heart attack, they have a migraine. Don't get it the other way around, don't get it wrong. If you think you've had a heart attack, don't think, oh, it's just a migraine, I'll stay at home. Go and get yourself checked out. But, but people who get repeated episodes of pain may find, for instance, uh, children who get tummy pain and abdominal migraine, we all recognize that but we don't recognize it. We, it. It's true that it happens, but a lot of people don't recognize that migraine could present, for instance, with pain in a leg or pain in an arm. And when you get chronic migraine, you go from Snowdon to the Yorkshire Dales. Instead of down from sea level and up to a severe attack with a sort of mountainous height to the, to the severity and back to sea level and normal again, that's episodic migraine. But over time, the frequency builds up of the attacks they get longer and longer, the gaps fill in with miles of migraineous headaches. And instead of going back down to sea level and headache free, you end up always at elevated altitude with a slight, you know, a rolling countryside of, of better days and worse days, but not the huge excruciating single migraines. 
your acute drugs become less effective, your painkillers, and you start getting a whole load of other features that are pervasive. So that's chronic migraine. And I'll come back and talk about this in the future, but with migraine come all these other things. So people get diagnosed with fibromyalgia, irritable bowel, chronic fatigue, dizziness, vertigo, tingling, anxiety, panic, hallucinations, memory changes. That's what we see in migraine. So people often don't recognize it's all part of the condition. Right, just this is in the slides, but this is a booklet that I've written about migraine and other headaches. And I'd strongly recommend you have a look at this. I wrote it for the NHS Vanguard. It's got a lot of information about how to manage yourself, which I've heard is quite popular in Ireland these days. Um, but maybe I won't, maybe I shouldn't say that too much. But if you want to help manage yourself, the, this booklet can be extremely helpful. Cluster headache then. So cluster headache is generally thought to be the worst pain known to man. Uh, it's for no small reason that people also call this suicide headache. When you set foot in your GP surgery or your, you know, your consultant's uh, office, you may look absolutely fine between attacks. So I ask people if they're getting attacks to get one of their, get their partner to video them in an attack, they'll suddenly rush you through and they'll ask you whether you want an ambulance. Okay. So that's a good, it's a good thing to do to let people see the attack. So we think that um, cluster headaches, possibly the most painful condition known, can happen at any age, children through to adults. My mum, she first got her cluster headaches when she was about 82 and she's now 94 and she still gets some occasion, occasional bouts. It is more common in males. I don't think it's 10 to one, 10 males to one female, it's more like sort of six to, it's more like sort of, I don't know, two to one or three to two. For women, it's generally considered that they would rather go through childbirth every day than have cluster headache because the attacks are just so awful. The attacks have circannual and circadian periodicity. In other words, it may happen at the same time each year. You know, it happened at the beginning of August last year, it happened at the beginning of August two years before that. And circadian periodicity is the attacks often just wake me up within half an hour of going to bed, or it often happens at 7 p.m. Certain timing. And the reason for this is probably because it's linked in to the brain centers or the centers below the brain that control your circadian rhythms, the hypothalamus and those regions, which interestingly, if you prod something in them while people have awake brain surgery, those people become extremely restless and agitated on the table. So that's where the cluster headache is generated. It's the same regions that control these, these natural body rhythms, but also they're involved in agitation and restlessness. With cluster headache, they're highly stereotyped attacks, they respond to specific treatments. And because of that, we need to make sure we get the diagnosis right. We need to treat effectively and promptly. So cluster attacks usually start abruptly, usually finish fairly abruptly, typically last 20 minutes to four hours. Occasionally we'll see shorter or longer ones. But you've got to be aware there are some inconsistencies. 30% of people will have a background bilateral pain. So that often puts people off giving you the right diagnosis. And although it's said to be a unilateral disorder just on one side of the head, 1% of people may have bilateral cluster headache at the same time. And some people, for instance, they'll have one bout one year and it'll be on one side and three years later it may be on the other side. Excruciating pain, prominent autonomic features, restlessness and agitation. If you've got that, then you've probably got cluster headache. And as I said before, if you've got the migraine makeup, you could have all the other features of migraine. You could have the premonitory phase, yawning and feeling spaced out for a few hours before, diarrhea, passing a lot of urine. You could have aura, visual zigzags. One in five people with cluster headache get aura before their attacks if they get them in the day. One in five people get aura before their migraine. Aura is probably not owned by migraine. It's probably a brain, a setup of abnormal brain functioning that you have a predisposition to. And I think of these things as Lego building, you know, the sort of packs you get for Lego, where you can buy one pack and you can add to it with another pack and another pack. I think of the, the premonitory features, the aura features. I think of these like adding another building block pack to your condition. You can imagine the brain circuits of abnormal pain activity, of abnormal autonomic activity, 
of disordered concentration and thinking, but you've also got these meagerness features and you've got different circuits of brain activity that can give you these different features. An aura can potentially be linked in and an extra building block pack to your migraine or your cluster headache. So it could be part of that, but I don't think it's, I don't think it's owned by them. I think it's a separate phenomenon. Right, so alcohol can be, so cluster headache can be triggered by various things. We all know about alcohol triggering it, volatile smells. And this was the best picture I could find. Sorry, it's the best picture I could find for a hot environment triggering it. Um, so I'm, I apologize if that causes any offense, um, but I'll, I'll hopefully make up for it in a second. Um, we know that angina spray, GTN can trigger it. A lot of people go and seek out cold or they, they will do extreme physical activity to try and relieve it. And uh, just to show that, there we are, just to show that if people have different, you know, designs on different genders and like different genders, that's one for people who like men. Okay, I think that's evened it out nicely. At least I can't get anything thrown at me while I'm doing this lecture online. That's, that's always useful to know. So cluster headache, those are the autonomic symptoms. That's a picture to describe the droopy eye, um, tearing, blocked, runny nose. And you can see why people get diagnosed as having facial palsy when they turn up, you know, Bell's palsy when they turn up in, in A&E. They've got lost their forehead creases, their, eye, their face looks drooped, and their eyes shutting. Actually, facial palsy, you can't shut your eye, but this is often a, it commonly leads to misdiagnosis. Frequency of cluster headaches, as I mentioned before, they often happen at the same time, typically just after going to sleep. Early a.m. wakening, tea time and evening are the commonest times. Um, and it's not just about the pain, it's about the fatigue, the poor sleep, the depression, the poor concentration and the poor memory. So a lot of people are very unwell, even when they're not having the attacks. This is a useful reference slide to sort of try and work out whether you have cluster headache or migraine. And the bits in red really highlight it. These are the bits that really tell you it's cluster. Restless, horrifically severe. Migraine is severe. Don't get me wrong. Migraine is, is awful. And, you know, it's just the worst until cluster headache comes along. And then the pain is just indescribable. Very prominent autonomic features, really prominent. Alcohol triggers immediately within 90 minutes and the attacks are short and typically it's sidelogged. All the other features on this slide don't really tell you anything or a sensitivity to noise or light. People in cluster headache may have episodic or chronic and chronic doesn't mean it's bad. Chronic means it's just going on for a long time. So it means they've had a year of, of cluster headache without at least a month free of attacks. Chronic is less common than episodic, but as you see here, it may transform between episodic and chronic, and usually it goes between, it goes from episodic to chronic, but we occasionally see people who were chronic and it becomes episodic, and that's always nice to see. Just briefly, so I don't miss it out, the other headache disorders, hemicrania continua, this is a one, this is, this is hemicrania continua, this lady with the knife in her head, you get stabbing headaches, one-sided or one-sided predominant pain in the head or face. You get the cranial autonomic disturbance with the, the eye, the nose, and the, the jaw and the mouth. But you also see jabs and so you see jabs and stabs, and you get days. It will be a day or two days where it's really bad. It's not as bad as cluster, but it's bad. Um, it's supposed to respond to indomethacin. I think there are many people that don't, and we use a lot of things like nerve blocks and actually gamma core. Um, is one of my go-tos for that. It can work in about 50% of people. Paroxysmal hemicrania, just like cluster headache, but shorter attacks, typically 10 to 40 attacks a day, 10 to 20 minutes each. And some sooner I've already talked about, unlike trigeminal neuralgia, it's typically around the eye or the upper part of the face. Um, unlike trigeminal neuralgia, which Literally, if you keep on touching or you keep on talking, trigeminal neuralgia may settle down for a, a period of time. This one, it keeps happening with every single time you touch or talk. So what do we really want when we manage patients with cluster headache? We want patient education. Um, we want GP education. We want other treating people to recognize it. We want good prophylactic treatment. Ideally, we can prevent it happening. We want good symptomatic treatment, things that get the actual symptoms of your attacks. Some people need investigation just to make sure there's nothing else happening. You really want support. 
and ideally research will lead to better treatments. So managing cluster headache, it's worth noting that 30%, I said this before, but some people will have just the attacks, some people will have 30% will have a background to it where maybe there's a background pain just on one side and then they get the superimposed attacks once or twice or three times a day. But there's a, that, that background is on the one side, it's on the same side as the headache. If, on the other hand, you've developed a background bilateral headache in addition to your cluster headache attacks, that's most likely because you're using your sumatriptan quite frequently or taking other painkillers. And then you've got a medication overuse headache. So the, the clue between whether you've got a background headache that's part of cluster or background headache that's part of medication overuse headache is that the medication overuse headache develops in time and it's bilateral, it's not just one side. What do I do if, I, if someone comes to me and I'm, you know, I've, I'm seeing them, they're in a bout of cluster headache and they're really, really desperate. My, my go-to is nerve blocks. And these, these slides are, are where we inject. So we start off with the greater and lesser occipital nerves so sort of two injections at the back of the, the back of the head here around the greater and the lesser occipital nerves, local anesthetic and steroid. For many people that will see off the bout and they're fine, but if it doesn't work a week later, I might see them back again, do it again, and I'll inject in front of the ear and just above the eyebrow for these other nerves. And about 50% to 70% of people during a bout we can control. And I think that's the best way of controlling them if you have access to it. Um, I review patients with acute bouts of cluster headache frequently. If they're not responding quickly to this, I might give a reducing course of steroids over 21 days. And if I'm gonna do that, I'll try and capitalize on that time and consider starting a longer term preventative, usually for Rapamil, or occasionally we'll look at gamma core depending on the circumstances. I want to make sure that that patient's got a good attack, acute attack treatment. So. The main acute attack treatment will be sumatriptan. Subcutaneous sumatriptan is, in my view, the quickest acting and the most effective treatment, which now comes in three milligram versions. And I'm, I'm wary of what I'm saying here, may not always translate to Ireland, but certainly in the UK, we guess it's three milligrams and six. You can have up to four injections of three milligrams a day. So it can, can absolutely transform your life if you get access to enough of it. And you know the worst is that you go to a GP and they'll give you three injections of it. You need it, you know, maybe 28 injections or 56 injections, depending on how often your attacks are. Nasal triptans, if you get them, don't make the mistake of putting your head back. It just goes down the back of your throat. Head forward, keep it forward for a minute or so afterwards so that you can actually, it will absorb around the lining of the nose. Um, that can be useful. It doesn't work quite as quickly. And when we're looking at cluster headache, attacks happening from nighttime, waking you from sleep, you want something that's going to work as quickly as possible because it's already been going on in your sleep. And general rule is that the quicker you get the treatment in, the more likely it is to work. If you wait, it may not work. The NICE guidelines in the UK allow for up to 12 milligrams of subcutaneous sumatriptan. And that's really important when you're going to see GPs to quote them this because it is a, it's a very relevant and it's a cost effective process. This is, this is all worked out on what's cost effective. The NICE guidelines are worked out because it's cost effective and clinically appropriate to give patients the right amount of triptans. In our scenario, if we're not seeing a response to oxygen or triptans, we personally go for gamma core and it may be very useful in about 50% of patients in acute bouts. Avoid the triggers, give support where you can. That's what I do. Um, so acute attack treatments can be oxygen, triptans, or gamma core, non-invasive vagal nerve stimulation, and we do it for each attack. Managing a cluster bout, we might do a greater occipital nerve block or a multiple cranial nerve block, and it potentially stops the bout. If, on the other hand, we gave steroids here, it may just work for the duration that you take the steroids, and as soon as you wean off the steroids, the cluster headaches will come back. Steroids have no effect on the actual bout. They don't terminate a bout. They don't terminate about, they just help on the days that you're taking them. So in the olden days, before we did many nerve blocks or gave anything else, this would be our go-to, but this is after nerve blocks now, I might start a reducing course of prednisolone, say 60 milligrams, reducing every three days, down to 50 milligrams, then 40 milligrams, et cetera, until stopped at the same time as starting a long-term preventative where verapamil 
an unlicensed drug, but one that's recognized to work in Clostetic, one, one of the only things that's been proven alongside Gamacor to work as a preventative for, for cluster headache, Verapamil will be our first go-to tablet therapy. And as you see here, the steroids work while you're taking them, but by the time the steroids have worn off, the verapamil is taking effect and starting to reduce your attacks. If verapamil works, you might just go straight back to it over two or three days in the next bout. So you go back to the dose you had. Medication overuse, well, it's, it's the hit that most people are prepared to take with regular triptans. And you have to make up your own mind. It's very hard not to treat attacks of cluster headache. It's a usual reasonable, uh, reasonable trade-off. You can get medication overuse from overusing oxygen. So if you're using oxygen, use it for less than 25 minutes at a time and for maybe less than three or four times a day. Otherwise, it may just make everything much worse. So for acute attack treatments, we want things that work quickly, that are absorbed quickly and have the best chance of working if they're taken as quickly as possible in the attack. Um, and we want them to be a reasonable cost. So these are the main ones for acute attack treatments. We've got oxygen, triptans and gamma core. Certainly in the UK, we have. Nasal dihydroagotamine is in the US. Ocreotide is sort of out there. It's not much evidence. Nasal lidocaine is messy and not much evidence. And lanzapine is not much evidence. And magic mushrooms or psilocybin, here's a picture of, um, oh, maybe it's not the police. Maybe I've got that wrong. But that's, the, I hope there aren't too many police, policemen out there who are offended by that picture. Um, anyway, magic mushrooms, the whole point of this picture is they're not legal, certainly in the UK, they're class A drugs. So it's not really what we want to be giving patients or patients taking, although anecdotally some patients swear by them. Traditional treatment with oxygen is a bag and mask, 12 to 15 litres a minute, and people often do quite well from this, but it can take quite a long time to start working. If we go forward with a demand valve, this is a bit like the valve that you have on Entonox when you have gas and air in, in um, childbirth. You only get the oxygen when you breathe it, but it's very, very highly pushed in, you know, it's under high pressure. This is much safer, it's cheaper, it's a potentially a lot more effective. It's just a question of whether the oxygen companies will allow you to have this. And basically in, in the UK, people can get extra cylinders to go on holiday in the UK or their place of work. So oxygen is great if you can't take triptans because of things like angina or heart disease, it's cheaper than triptans, but for some patients, it just delays the attack. Can't use it in patients with very severe respiratory disease. It's a really big fire risk. And for anyone with oxygen out there, just be aware that if you use facial creams, then, um, you can actually um, get very severe burns if you were to catch, catch light. They're highly flammable, some of these facial creams. Um, so you just need to be careful and be aware that for half an hour after using oxygen, you are oxygen enriched, your hair, your clothing. So you don't want to go near a cigarette or an oven or something with a heat source or even a vape device within half an hour of using oxygen. Otherwise you may find that you get severe burns. I'm not gonna go through that, because that's for the Walton Center. Um, subcutaneous triptans are the treatment of choice, but they're about 25 pounds a shot, but they work effectively. Uh, I'm not gonna go through too much about this because it's not so relevant to you today, but it's in the slides if you want it. We used to tell people how to split the Imigran version of, of, uh, of the injectors uh, by sawing things in half, but now they do a three milligram version, so you don't need to start sawing off your own like sawn off shotgun for your attacks. Nasal Zomig is probably nice tasting and not as bitter as the nasal sumatriptan. You could have say up to five milligrams three times a day and it can be quite helpful. And subcutaneous, uh, so nasal sumatriptan, again, it's quite cheap. Um, so it can be useful, especially if you're out and about or if your GP is reluctant to give you uh, Sumatriptan injections, which I believe are on a named patient basis in Ireland, which makes it a bit more tricky. So this is how I do it. So this should be the summary slide of what you take away in terms of what you want to try and get. So acute attack medication, make sure you get your Sumatriptan injectors or your nasal sprays. If they're not working, I would then go to oxygen at that point. And if I haven't seen a response, I would go to gamma core at that, that point in the NHS. Although some of my private patients will go to gamma core uh, more quickly. 
and obviously as and privately we can we can issue gamma core prescriptions as well um and I'm, i don't know if carly's going to talk at the end of this but there may be a there may be some thing in the in the sort of pipeline for looking at cluster headache patients to be able to purchase this themselves so i'll leave that in carly's in carly's uh, area the intermediate preventative strategy what can i do fairly quickly to get on top of the bout not just for treating the attacks I can do nerve, occipital nerve blocks. I can do multiple cranial nerve blocks. You know, if I had one thing in my armory, that would probably be the, the thing that gets most people quickly sorted out. I might use a three week course of reducing prednisolone and at the same time initiate for rapamil, but monitor the ECG very closely to make sure it's not causing a slow heart rate or what we call heart block. And for those that end up on for rapamil, you must make sure you get ECGs at least every six months because the same dose of rapamil you can see the heart suddenly blocking and becoming a problem. Longer term preventatives, I think nerve blocks and, and verapamil and gamma core have an equal role to play long term. They can work very well long term. In our pathway at the Walton Centre, we start with nerve blocks, we go to verapamil and then we go to gamma core. So we would use gamma core as third line as a, as a preventative. But if patients haven't responded to the triptans or oxygen satisfactorily, we will go to gamma core as an episodic treatment. It's worth just bearing in mind that those who respond best to gamma core for their actual attacks will be those with episodic cluster headache, those ones who are in about, for say, three months of the year. Whereas those who tend to respond best to the preventative tend to be those who are having a much more prolonged bout or who have gone into chronic cluster headache. Um, other than that, we're then into a sort of bit of a guessing game. Lithium is quite an effective drug, but it's, it comes with a huge amount of monitoring and it's quite, quite tricky. Topiramate very often isn't tolerated and causes depression and, and memory problems, which stop when you stop the drug. And then the other drugs, very few patients respond to, so we try them and they often don't work. We're just starting to look at the CGRP monoclonal antibodies with cluster headache. I think this is an emerging area. We have got one or two highly refractory patients in our NHS practice who are going on these, but it's too early to know exactly how effective they are. I don't think they're as good for, for cluster as they are for migraine. Um, quite commonly, we see it get rid of the background headaches more than the attacks, um, but it can have some effect. Sometimes we admit patients to hospital for a week of intravenous dihydrogotamine, very rarely we use things like Botox or IV ketamine. And then for those that are really struggling, we go to occipital nerve stimulation. So that's what we're doing at the moment, but where are we heading? So Gamma Core, this is the device that we're talking about. Very simple, easy to use on the side of the neck, approximately one and a half to two minutes each stimulation. If you do use this, I normally recommend using it three stimulations, three times a day on the affected side. I know the company would say two stimulations, but I think personally, my experience with using it three, three and three can be really effective. You need to be aware this may take anywhere up to 10 months to reach its best effect. So if you've, normally we would look at a three month trial period and if it's not worked at all in three months and it's been pulling the lip down on the affected side, which is what it's supposed to, we would give up. If it's had some benefits at three months, I would continue because the benefits can slowly get better and better and better anywhere up to 10 months. Um, and you can use that in the acute attacks as well as that. So I'm not going to go through all the data there, but it's there if you want to go through it yourself. Um, oops, that's the one I want. Uh, I've talked about nerve blocks. They're very safe and very effective. Um, very few side effects of any. And that's my anecdotal experience. I think migraine responds about 50% of the time to nerve blocks. But for the Hemicrania and episodic cluster, it's about three quarters of patients will do really well. Chronic cluster may be slightly, not quite as good, but they can work in my experience, typically for three to eight months. We've got some patients who they'll work from a year, year and a half on, you know, they can work for a very long time. And this is the CGRP monoclonal antibodies of four drugs. I just want to put this slide in because at the moment we are recruiting, but it's in the UK for studies of our IV eptinezumab. Um, which is an intravenous infusion, which hopefully will, if the trial is positive, it will come out into clinical practice. If we're really stuck, we refer to surgeons for occipital nerve stimulation these days, but many people have problems with the device or complica you know, complications of infection or 
you know, the battery runs out, it's not good. We really did like this device when it was out. It was a little implanted device that went into the, under the skin, in, into the cheek, and the, the wire just went into a, a fossa where the sphenopalatine mm. ganglion is. And it was all controlled with a handheld device. Um, but that company is no, no longer is no longer there, and no one has taken this over yet. But I think it was a good technique, and I think that will come back at one point if someone buys a company back or starts it up again. Just some very nice pictures from what we were doing there. So the future direction we really want, well, what do we want? We want things that are effective, safe, tolerable, practical, make you want to do it. We want them to be, we want you to be compliant. We don't want to affect you if you've had a baby on these and uh, we don't want a damaged baby. We want something that's not too expensive and we need to be careful of our own national health service resources. So what is the future direction? Is it drugs? Is it tablets? Maybe. They're not often very good for compliance. People don't like taking medications every day. Is it handheld stimulators? Pros are that it's not drugs. Disadvantages, you have to do something. You have to invest time in your condition. But that's not necessarily a bad thing. People who invest time in their condition often are those who do well. Doing a one-off, one-stop injection where they come and then they disappear. You know, when nerve blocks work and work effectively, it's just brilliant because it just makes everything so simple as long as people can access this. And then we've got new systemic injections and other things coming out. Um, we have a pathway in the Walton Center, which the slides will show you, and I've already outlined this. So I'm not going to go through these again, but this summarizes what we do at the Walton Center, which you may find helpful if you're going to see a specialist locally, because they may be able to follow these sorts of um, these, you know, this sort of pathway of treatment in that order. So coming back to those four patients, so a 36-year-old man with a constant unilateral headache, we know that 30% of patients with cluster can have a background headache, so he's got cluster. This next lady, she has episodes of bilateral headache. That's the funny thing here. The rest of it sounds like cluster, but we know 1% of people can have bilateral cluster headache. This 18-year-old is absolutely typical cluster headache until I tell you that she's got zigzag kaleidoscope visual disturbance. But as you now know, one in five have aura with cluster headache and one in five have aura with migraine and aura isn't owned by either condition. And then this last patient who's never had pain, but he's had the symptoms in his eye and he's had the feeling flushed and sweaty and earfulness and happening four to five times a day, we know that cluster headache can happen without pain. And just because it's happening without pain doesn't mean that this chap is, you know, all rosy in his life. This chap is still very depressed. He can't sleep at night. He can't concentrate. And he's really affected because it's not just the pain that gets you down here. It's the whole condition. And we see people pushed into very severe depression. And I've even got about four patients who have been pushed into psychosis during their bouts. So with that, I just want to leave you with some useful information um, out to UK website, my migraine booklet that I wrote for the NHS Vanguard. And I'm not touting for, for business because I'm already busy enough. But if people are stuck, I, I always have a sort of a place in my heart for patients with cluster headache because I feel very sorry for people who can't access treatment. So uh, I do do um, all my consultations privately now as video from Spire Cheshire Hospital. And that's my secretary's details if you want to make any inquiries there. Um, the other point to make is that in the NHS, if you are referred appropriately by an NHS or by a, a national consultant in Ireland, I think there is a process that you can be referred over to a centre like ours where we're a refractory centre, the Waltham Centre um, in Liverpool, um, by your consultants for treatment. But it is a tricky system to navigate. I'll quieten down. I've done too much talking, so thank you very much. <laughs>